higher geography biosphere uh, soil formation. Whilst watching this video it might be an idea to take down some notes maybe in the form of a mind map and uh, we're going to be looking at the factors that influence how soil is formed um, and how it gets its various characteristics. We build on soil, we farm it, we play on it and we couldn't really survive without it. It's arguably one of the most important non-renewable resources on the planet. Uh, it's also home to countless organisms and it forms a really thin layer uh, lying on bedrock. So understanding the content, the formation and the characteristics of just a few types of soil uh, is, is really uh, quite important. This is because soil is, is really a central part of the system that links the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere and the, the biosphere, all the topics that we look at in the, the physical part of the geography course. So what is soil? Uh, a really, it's basically a mixture of particles, weathered rock, decayed organic matter, some water and a few gases in which some living organisms are present. There are four main types or there are four main parts to every soil. The first main part is the mineral matter. This makes up around about 45% of most soils and basically it's derived from the parent material. Um, by physical and chemical weathering. Uh, the parent materials are the fragments of rock called regolith which can come from the underlying bedrock or especially in Scotland from glacial deposits. The second part of the soil is the organic material. This is mainly derived from decaying roots, leaves, needles and remains of dead organisms and all these materials are broken down by the action of lots of little microorganisms and larger life forms, things like worms and moles. The final two parts of the soil are the air and water content and these are ever changing in their values and their volumes and they basically take up all the voids, the spaces in the soil. In a well drained soil water is going to form a film around the, the mineral particles and allows space for entry of air and gases into the soil. Uh, and a well, a well aerated soil can rapidly change when the soil is saturated with water. The texture, colour and chemical composition of the soil uh, can be very different. These are influenced by really six main soil forming factors. Uh, they are the parent material, the so biotic factors that are involved, the climate of an area, the relief of the land, the amount of time that the soil has been there and quite an important one is the role of, of humans and human activity. We will go into each of these factors in a little bit more detail over the following few slides. The parent material of any soil can vary from, it can be anything from solid bedrock to a wide range of loose deposits, things like alluvium, uh, gravels, sands and maybe glacial deposits. The underlying geological material really determines the soil. Okay, So what's lying underneath uh, in the bedrock really influences the characteristic of the soil. Soils generally inherit a great deal of their structure and the minerals that are in them from this base parent material. The parent material then goes on to influence how um, quickly or slowly the soil is weathered, the chemical makeup of the soil, the different colour of the soil and the actual texture of its of the soil as well. They're all based on what parent material it comes from. You know, what is the, the rock or the material that makes up that soil. If the parent material is say a hard rock then it's going to weather slowly and you're going to have a very thin soil and if it's a softer say sedimentary rock things like limestone or chalk they weather more quickly and you get a much thicker soil. The parent material is also going to determine the um, chemical composition of the soil, whether it's acidic, you know, things like granite are going to produce an acidic soil, whereas things like chalk and limestone are going to produce a more alkali soil. The colour as well is influenced by the, the parent material, so if it's, if it's light in colour, the parent material, you're going to get a light soil. Okay? Uh, if it's dark, then you're going to get a rich soil. Uh, something that uh, has lots of iron, maybe a darker soil. If it's a sedimentary 
um, rock, things like red sandstone, then you're going to get a red soil. The final influence is over the texture or the feel of the soil. It's influenced by the size of the mineral particles uh, in the soil. The smaller the particles, the less permeable the, so the soil is. So things like clay, they've got really small particles and there's not really well aerated, there's not much air in it. It's dense and it's therefore easily waterlogged. Whereas things that are sandy, maybe it's more porous, there's more space between the particles and water can flow through it easily. So you get a, a, a soil that drains easier. Things like podzols and brown earths, which we'll come to look at later on. Overall, things that are sandy and porous, things that are soils that are maybe derived from granite and sandstone, they're easily leached. That will come onto leaching in a in a in a moment. But basically, it means that the water can flow through it easily, and it gives rise to soils called podzols and brown earths. Things that are more clay-like, um, maybe are things that are derived soils that are derived from basalts, um, volcanic rock or igneous rock are not well aerated, there's not much space between the clay particles and they get really easily waterlogged so you get soils called clays which are basically waterlogged soils. The second factor that influences soil formation is the biotic factor so that's basically the action of any vegetation, plants and any organisms that are uh, in using the soil. Right, So it could be anything from bacteria to small mammals, vertebrates uh, anything in. So the organisms in the vegetation, they help to produce the organic material in the soil. This is known as humus. So usually found, this is usually found on the top layer of the soil and it's known as the, what's called the AO horizon. Right, it can also be mixed into the layer below, known as the A horizon. We'll talk more as we go through about horizons in the soil, but basically a horizon is a distinct layer of the, the soil. So the humus is found in the top horizon or layer and maybe in the layer underneath when, if, when it's mixed in or if it's been mixed in. So here you see a simplified diagram which shows the top horizons of a soil profile. So you've got the AO horizon on top, which is the very top layer. Uh, with the plants and the roots in there, it's fairly usually fairly neutral uh, in pH, and then the layer below is the a, the A horizon. So this is where you might have mixing of the organic materials. You might have earthworms and various other. You see some examples here of some of the different um, organisms that can be in the soil, and as they move around, they aerate the soil. So they introduce air and spaces and gaps into the soil, and they also help to mix the soil up and mix it up with all the the nutrients and minerals that are in there. All the while you have an input from the plants that are on the surface, so if they shed leaves or drop needles or you know if they die off they decay and break down and join in with the soil as well. So that there's an input there from the surface. So there are three main types of humus. There's a more humus, a mull humus and a motor humus, which is basically a combination or a, somewhere in between mull and moor. Moor humus is the type of humus that you would find in a coniferous forest or maybe in a heather moorland. So usually in places where you have a cooler, wet climate and there's an acidic parent material, you've got the acidic uh, heather and acidic pine needles falling on the litter layer, the AO horizon of the, the soil and then being broken down and integrated into the soil. So you have these in cooler, temperate, north, places like northern um, coniferous forests, which will come on to, on the edge of the tundra. Uh, and they ha they've, because they've got an acidic parent material, they also create uh, an acidic soil. And because these are usually found in more northern climates, more than northern latitudes, there isn't as much organ uh, organic um, action. There isn't as many organisms in the soil because of the colder temperatures. They're just not as active and there aren't as many found there. So there's less mixing in these soils and they have more of a distinct layering between each of the different horizons. A mull humus is much more fertile. It's usually really well aerated. There's lots of 
air particles in the soil. There's and there's a really plentiful supply of litter, and it's usually found underneath places like deciduous woodlands, where there's lots of leaves which have got lots of nutrients in them, falling onto the litter layer, breaking down and incorporating themselves into the into the soil. So it's usually a really good rich soil. And here you've got lots of uh, organisms, so you've got lots of mixing going on, and there's less of a distinct difference between each of the layers. You've got more of a sort of a gradual move from one layer into the next and more of a mixing. And basically, usually the soil is fairly neutral and it's home to lots of uh, organisms like earthworms, which are really good at decomposing and breaking down a lot of the material that comes into the soil from the, the forests. And as I said earlier, the motor humus is somewhere in between the two. It's neither more or mull, it's sort of a, an in-between intermediate soil. The third main factor is the climate, and it's really important because, especially where there's a big difference between the daytime and nighttime temperatures, and where there's maybe a lot of precipitation. Um, if there's low temperatures, the rate of soil formation is going to be slower, and the rate of decomposition in the soil is going to be slower. Uh, whereas if it's warmer, and there's warmer temperatures, it really encourages decomposition to happen, and it encourages the organic material to be incorporated in the soil, and you're going to find lots more organisms which are all mixing up the soil uh, and, and, and aerating it. Leaching is an important process that we should talk about here, and it's influenced by the climate. So basically, where you have more precipitation, then you have evapotranspiration, so more water going into the soil than being evaporated out of it, then you have a movement uh, of the water down through the soil, right? So vertically through, through the soil, maybe v uh, down a slope. And that, as it moves through the soil, you get the soluble minerals and the humus are moved with it through the soil. So it helps to um, take the humus and incorporate it into the lower down layers of the soil. Capillary action or capillary movement is basically the opposite of leaching. So if you've got more evapotranspiration happening than precipitation, maybe where it's a dry climate and you don't have much water coming into the soil, then the minerals uh, and the humus can be drawn towards the surface by the solution. So there's less mixing further down through the soil and you have a very thin and less nutritious soil. Relief in the shape of the land influences how well drained the soil is and also the depth of it as well. So if you look at the diagram here, you see that uh, in the upper area where you've got a well drained, what's called a shedding site, so there's basically surface water, it's going to fall on that site and it's going to run off down the slope or uh, infiltrate into the soil and be soil through flow. So as the water does that, it's obviously going to take with it organic and mineral material. So the receiving site at the bottom of the slope gains in water and organic material and, and minerals. And if the receiving site is particularly badly drained, uh, all the excess water is going to accumulate, you're going to have pools and ponds possibly forming, and it's going to encourage the formation of clay soils and uh, waterlogged soils and possibly peaty soils as well. Now, depending on the steepness of the slope, if you've got a really steep slope, then you might well get some sort of mass movement happening here, some slumping, um, and the soil is going to move down the slope, and at the bottom, you're going to get a very, you know, a new soil occurring. So you're not going to, in the receiving site, get a very mature soil. It's not going to have time to develop. Now, the relief and the aspect of a particular site can also modify the the amount of soil that's created. You know, if you've got a really shady north facing slope, it's going to be colder and it's going to be wetter compared to a south facing slope. And that's going to slow down the amount of decomposition that goes on and it's going to encourage things like peats to form really boggy um, soil. Altitude and height is really important as well. So the higher up you are, the lower the temperature and therefore the less uh, um, activity you're going to have in the soil, less biotic activity, and also your growing season is going to be reduced as well. So plants aren't going to grow for as long, and there's not going to be as much uh, litter, and generally higher altitudes you have more precipitation as well, so you're going to have a higher water input. Right, fifth critical influence is time. So for a soil to fully develop and fully mature, you need to have time. 
Um, so when they're young, soils have got the features of the parent material, so they're not very different from the underlying bedrock or whatever material they're, they're based on. Um, this is particularly true in Scotland because we are, we've got relatively young soil um, because of the last ice age. We had a huge ice sheet across the whole country and that has only disappeared in the last 10,000 years. Earlier soils are generally ones that are formed in, in maybe warmer conditions. So um, in Scotland these were basically swept away by the glaciers and moved by the, the ice as it bulldozed across the country. So soil, soils in Scotland have mainly developed on top of this glacial till or, or boulder clay and they've developed in the last 10,000 years or so. And the last influence on soil formation is human activity and this is pretty important, it shouldn't really be underestimated. So if we go back, you know, we're talking maybe three to 4,000 years uh, BC, uh, where prehistoric civilizations begin to start doing things like felling trees, burning heather, um, and sort of speeding up things that were uh, happening, the soil erosion and increasing the rate that these were happening at. Now, if we come more to the present day, these trends have increased and human activity is really, really important. Um, so things like blanket planting of, of coniferous trees, uh, where Originally there might have been deciduous mixed woodland, that completely changes the soil underneath. You have acidic pine needles falling on soil that was maybe used to having deciduous leaves in it, and it completely changes the characteristic of the soil, the soil chemistry, uh, and to get round that, people then put on fertilisers, they spread lime, they spray pesticides, and these again change the soil characteristics and change uh, what's going on underneath the surface. So this is really an introduction as to how the um, soil takes on its characteristics, how the main types form and the things that influence their formation. So throughout the world there's an enormous variety in types of soil and it's really understandable because there's lots of different combinations of these factors and some places are more important than, than in others. So it's quite important that you understand the main soil forming characteristics or factors and um, then can then relate these to some of the case studies and major soil types that we're going to be looking at. Uh, really, there's three main types of soil groupings that uh, pedologists, that's people that study soil, that they've come up with. Now, and these three main groupings have got what's called zonal soils. Zonal soils are basically soils that match to a particular natural region. So you might have a particular soil which belongs to the temperate broadleaf deciduous woodlands or a one that belongs to the coniferous forests. Um, and such, these soils have matured over a long period of time so that climate and the organisms in the soil have been particularly effective. So you have a really well-defined, mature soil which is influenced by basically the climate zone that they're in. Hence, they're called zonal soils. Intrazonal soils, the second grouping, are really more influenced by local factors. So they don't really involve climate or the type of uh, organisms that you find in the soil, but really it's down to the, the parent material here. So chalk creates particular soil in the south and east of England. And let's, you know, the sort of lime-rich soil that they have down there. It's called calcareous brown earth. Um, and then maybe things like local drainage and slopes and aspect, they become more important the amount of groundwater there is. Okay, um, so the more intrazonal soils are things like glaze and brown earth soils. Uh, the final group of soils is azonal soils. So they're basically immature soils, ones that haven't ha really had time to progress and develop, um, and they haven't developed horizons. So they maybe only have an A horizon and possibly a B horizon, uh, and they're found maybe, like in Scotland, where there's recent glacial uh, activity and you've got lots of glacial deposits, maybe somewhere in a river floodplain which regularly floods where you have fresh alluvium spreading across the floodplain or maybe somewhere where you have uh, lots of volcanic activity and a volcanic soil developing so it's constantly changing and anything that is there hasn't been there for a particularly long uh, period of time in geological sense. So that's a brief rundown of soils uh, and the main factors that influence them. We'll move on next to look at the, the selected soils and the three case studies that we need to look at.